You are very welcome along to episode two of the Hurling Pod. Plenty for us to talk about in the next hour or so. Cork laying down a marker ahead of the Munster Championship, which is less than 50 days away by defeating the All-Ireland Champions Limerick at the Gaelic Grounds to maintain their 100% start. Wexford also three from three. Rory O'Connor inspired model side, beating Galway in Salt Hill. The Walsh Cup winners Dublin continuing their impressive start by triumphing in Thurless against Tipperary. Tony Kelly back with a bang. Two goals and 12 points for him as Clare ran out. Easy enough winners in the final quarter against Offaly. Tom Phelan hit the net twice for Kilkenny in their victory against Leash. And Waterford surviving a late scare, and Neil McManus' penalty being tipped over the bar in the closing stages as they beat the Saffrons in Corrigan Park. It's been a pretty crucial third weekend of the National Hurling League. I'd like to say that James Skehill is here alongside me firstly. James, I'm going to ask you about a man who came up to you before we bring Paul Murphy into this, a Wexford supporter. They travelled in droves, I believe, to go to Salt Hill at the weekend. Mm-hmm. And he was complimenting you on Finally, Wexford getting a bit of credit. Gary, would you believe it was your right way? It was my first game in Pierce Stadium to attend as a as a supporter, if you like. And certainly the whites that we'd we tip in, you know, and we're walking into the stadium. And this fella comes running up to us. Um, needless to say, head to toe in Wexford gear and hits me a, a pat in the back and says, Goodbye, Sky Hill. About time we got a bit of respect in the rankings. <laughs> Fright- he frightened the, the life out of the wife to know how it was going on. He thought he was coming to knock me over or something, but uh, just goes to show that the Wexford people there, they're, they'd be listening to the pod anyway. Well, it's good to hear they're listening and watching along. Lots of kind of positive feedback from last week. If anyone wants to get in touch, by the way, you can just tweet us. At, I think any of our individual Twitters or if you want to tweet at Off The Ball or if you're watching us, just leave a comment on the YouTube video and we'll address them next week because I think there's plenty of talking points uh, coming out of this week. Um, it's, it's good to hear, Skelly, we're getting a little bit of credit going in. It just goes to show, though, I saw some of the pictures of the Wexford fans on the way into Salt Hill. Good start to the league for them. Beating the All-Ireland Champions in the first round. They travelled west in their droves yesterday. They did, yeah. And like we mentioned last week about momentum and the, and you know that any successful team let's say momentum was a big helper to them. Um because it just brings back positive energy into the dressing room, positive energy into the fans, it gets the whole place talking. And they were going home happy yesterday. They were jubilant, they were, you know, it, it had a bit of a championship feel about it <clears throat> walking out. And um especially when the when the second goal went in, there was a fair roar from the crowd. You knew there were watching just a couple of hundred, it was a couple of thousand. Paul Murphy, did you have any Kilkenny supporters come up to you in Nolan Park taking any umbrage of what you had to say last week? No, no, no. They think they were, they were happy enough with their victory now. Um, I suppose, look at Kilkenny, and it's interesting looking at each team across the both, um, both groups that I suppose every supporter is coming at it from a different perspective. And each kind of, I suppose, any of the supporters that are fairly grounded and understand where their teams are at kind of, you know, I suppose they're, they're, they're starting to see a reflection of where their teams are at at the moment. So, no, look, at I think Kilkenny people, I mean, so far they haven't had a huge amount to complain about, really. Um, I mean, the Tipperary loss, you know, there wasn't a whole lot in it, but they could see, obviously, again, trying a good few new players, giving them a chance while mixing it with a bit of experience. So, like, I mean, again, a good victory again yesterday for Kilkenny. Um, you know, racked up a big score again. Tom Phelan, again, really, really weighed in. He was involved in, you know, a good few scores, maybe not as involved in, in, in the Tipperary match as he would have liked to be, but... You know, again, the inside forward line, 12 points in the first half. and everything. So there's a good few points to be encouraged about. Um, but I think that's really where the Kenny fans are looking at the moment. They're looking for the few positives. And the likes of the double match now next week, that's a huge one, I suppose, for really gauging exactly where the Kenny are at. Good performance against Tip. Strong performance yesterday, again, running out easy winners in the end. But um, look, again, I suppose the big one really is, is going facing an informed Dublin team next Saturday. Yeah, very tasty fixture. One we'll look forward to a little bit later on in the pod as well, because uh, as you mentioned, Dublin going really well. They backed up everything they did in the first two games by winning at Semple Stadium on Saturday night. In a match that was a little bit patchy. We might talk about some of the refereeing from the weekend where uh, the referee was maybe a little bit picky in that game. Then there was this weird spell of about eight or nine minutes where everything seemed to be let go, but it was kind of free after free during that game. And we'll talk a little bit maybe, lads, as well about the throwing of the ball. And I'm sure that's going to come up in uh, the Limerick against uh, Cork game where it was pulled few times by the referee during the match allegedly so I hear the referees had a conference last Wednesday week and it was spoken about that they had to look for a clear striking motion when it came to hand passes it's something that's probably been spoken about a few times and it's definitely spoken about a lot about Limerick I don't think it's necessarily James because Limerick throw the ball around more than other teams but maybe because Limerick hand pass a bit more than others that some of the throw passes that didn't have a clear striking movement ended up being uh, picked up in the footage yeah. of Limerick over the last few months. Yeah, it's just the way the game has evolved a bit, though. Like, I, obviously, we've, we've, there's been, you know, the game has gone from, gone away from the 15 on 15 lamp it down to the to the forwards and see who wins their own ball. It's, it's, more, it's more possession game now. Limerick have really kind of mastered that and everyone seems to be, think that 
in order to beat Limerick or beat the top teams, you've got to maintain your possession, possession 19 of the law. With possession comes a lot more passing, specifically hand passing is like. Um, I, I do feel like, look, I'm, I'm generally not really that sympathetic to referees, to be honest. <laughs> I know it's a bit hard because I, I look at it from the player's perspective and how the amount of time and preparation goes into to training and playing games that the referee then could, you know, knock you out of the season or get, be the cause of a losing in a match with, with one, one decision. But in this instance, I do feel sympathy because when you consider, like, the human eye captures 60 frames per second, you know, and if you were to slow down in a slow motion, you might capture a striking action. So I do believe the onus is on the player to show clear striking action. And if he's pulled, if he or she, should I say, is pulled, not showing clear striking action, that's their own fault, to be honest. You know, there was an instance shown yesterday where Garish McInerney did a top pass. He stood up and and uh, and uh, passed, passed forward. And in real time, when I was there, and when the referee gave the decision, I thought, yeah, that's definitely free. When it was slowed down, there was a... There was a, a obviously about an, an inch or two of release of the ball, but it was so fast the human eye couldn't capture it. You know, so I think obviously we have to keep the rule in the hand passing. We can't let throws go uh, willy nilly, and I just think it's going to be hammered home throughout the course of the year, especially when the possession game is involved. And you know, the, the trouble is as well, Will, is he when you when you get into such a high intense tackle environment, trying to get the ball away becomes even more intense. If a player generally is in open open space or he's got let's say five or six square yards in front of him, he'll, he'll do the, the striking action. He Generally, he'll give a good pass, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. the referee can see it. It's when he's bottled up and he's two or three bodies inside him and he's trying to get rid of it. He Lynch the master at it, you know. Uh, even for the goal yesterday, Keane Lynch got it off and so did Willard. But that, that's really where a lot of these things happen is where they're getting bottled up and they actually can't release their arm, you know, which they're found the ball. So the honest again is on the bypass of the ball, not the referee. Yeah, did you see this as much of an issue, Paul? Because as James said, this often comes up when players are about to go into contact and the space isn't there maybe to move their arm too much. And as opposed to a clear striking action with the hand coming out with the hand pass, it's more of a throw, it's more of a flick off to the side, which is fouling the ball. But now it seems that if referees are clamping down on it, as they did this weekend, and if the referees are meeting in Abbottstown and they're being told by those who are assessing the officials to keep an eye on it, then maybe this is something that's going to be refereed a little bit harder in the coming weeks at least. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it was it was evident yesterday. We've had two weekends already, like, and it was very evident yesterday that this was our over weekend, that this was something that had been talked about because, you know, across the board, the referees were in sync in, ter- in terms of at least calling it or being seen to be called it. I actually thought, you know, I suppose Sean Stack was the main one over the weekend with Limerick and Cork. And again, like, like James was saying there, if you're a more running team that you're going to run the ball like Limerick do up the pitch, even like Cork do up the pitch, you're then the team that's more inclined to be popping these little quick hand passes. You're also more likely the team that's going to run into contact, get into trouble. And then, like James was saying there, it's it's tough to try and get that pass away. I actually thought Sean Stack had a good game in terms of calling them. I think he called four or five. And even in replay, they were nailed on that they were, you know, they were throwing balls. Because I'm all for, again, like I think a lot of people, you know, don't call it unless you know for definite that it's, you know, there was no, I suppose, distance between the hand and the ball made. But I thought he, he called it very well. Um, again, the Garold McInerney one was a tough one because he was into contact and the ball was gone. He did it so quickly that it was a replay. And again, you can't fault the referee in that situation because he's trying his best. But I think, you know, it, we're talking about is it going to carry forward into championship? I think what these weekends often act for is, is like a circuit breaker, really, because they're seen developing bad habits. And I remember like this, this has often happened over different years where the referees might be a high tackle one weekend or it might be the hand pass another weekend. It might be steps another weekend, whatever it is. But we'd go back into training on a Tuesday night. You might be doing a drill. You know, Brian would cop on that lads aren't passing properly. He sees it that this is something we're going to be pulled for in a match. Stop the drill. Lads, listen, we know the referees are going to pull us for this. Get it right because it's a silly point to be given to the other team. So if anything, like every team is on high alert now. They're going out next weekend to go, right, lads, if we don't pass the ball properly, we're going to be bold. So exaggerated. And I think the one extra thing it actually does is it makes a player break that tackle and get away. Like he knows that he can't get away with the 50-50, was it or wasn't it? He has to show the referee that he's given a hand pass. So it nearly encourages one, the supporter to get up there and support the man. And also that the player himself in possession has to break away from the tackle and show the referee he's given a good hand pass as opposed to going into tackle and just throwing the ball out. If we allowed it to go on, I think that's what we'd see. We'd just see lads going in, the ball would pop out. Um, so in fairness referees they made a fair attempt at it and there wasn't many that you couldn't say they didn't get right in fairness I think they got the majority of them right over the weekend Lads over your playing career did the managers you work under bring in a local referee at times to maybe chat to you about the rules because I know this happened a few times with the 
changing rules about the cynical foul in hurling, which could see a player uh, taken off and also a penalty being awarded and in Gaelic football, a lot of county managers got in, say a local inter-county referee to have a chat to them when the mark was introduced and you know some of the other rules that were changed in recent seasons, particularly the, the kind of attacking mark. Did you have, say, any of, the, any of the managers you would have had, whether that be Mial Donahue or Brian Cody, lads, who would have maybe brought a referee in to chat to you about the way that rules were being enforced and being looked at? Uh, well, I, I, from our point of view, no, really, we didn't. We never had a referee come in and talk to us. I mean, it's a fair point and it's a good way because it's good to get the insight of a referee. What, what are the referees thinking? Because, again, you bring a referee in, OK, there's a certain amount he's, he, he's, he's liable to tell you. I don't see why a referee wouldn't tell you what they're talking about at these meetings, but it give you good insight. Generally, the way we seem to work it, look, the, the rules f- predominantly with hurling anyway are black and white. I know a few of the football can be a little bit harder to call and there's a little bit of confusion over them. But generally, you know, if there was confusion over it, what we would have done anyway, Brian would have said it to Martin Fogarty, would have said it to James McCarry, listen, find out for Tuesday night, make sure we're, before we start training, we're going to talk about this and we want everyone to know exactly. And it is what we're going to pull in training. Um, we never brought in outside referees to actually manage it. But for a session, let's say, Brian would rarely blow the whistle in a session, but he might blow it for the cynical one of the arm around the neck. You're, if you're going to get blown for it, he would blow for them because there's no point in you training as if you're not going to get blown for it, really. So that's the extent that we would have done it. But, like, I mean, James, Ian Galway, he might have been different, really. Yeah, we did, like, you see, I suppose throughout the course of the Welsh Cup and the league, you wouldn't really be doing your own in-house games. You'd have kind of me, Holly, be the referee, and, you know, there wouldn't be too much refereeing, to be honest, you know, a bit like Brian, <laughs> Brian Blount Kinney. And then as the kind of preparations for the championship kind of heat up, and we had taken maybe a couple of incidents that may, may have happened to the league from, from a rule perspective that is, as we see now with the, with, the, with the hand pass, we would bring up a referee to, to uh, I suppose, ref the trial game amongst us. You'd all, often have an A versus B. This could happen two, three times in a, in a championship season. You'd bring up an intercounty referee. We've had Oracle Hogan and we've had, you know, Johnny Murphy and these lads, come up, Brian Gavin and these lads. And after the, after the game finishes, you might get them to chat you for five minutes just to see what's the lay of the land with referees nowadays, what's the hot topic, if you, if you like. You know, I suppose there's. I remember Fergal Horgan, there was on about the frontal challenge, you know, the shoulder, as we see with Seamus Flanagan, he was saying that that's the hot topic at the minute, the high arm up in the neck, anything got to do with the head. Um, Johnny Murphy, another year, was saying about the face guard, the time when you come in contact with the helmet, that's just, it's an automatic red, so don't even come in contact with it. Those little things, obviously your management team would, would communicate that to you, but when it came from the words or the mouth of a referee, it seemed to carry more weight for some reason, I don't know why. But uh, it was just, I, I, maybe I'd say it was taken on board more by the players when it came from a guy who could be in the middle of the park, let's say, when you're playing a Kilkenny or a Tipperary, so you kind of take it on board a bit, a bit better. And I thought it was a good exercise, to be honest. I always liked when referees came up because, you know, a Galway perspective, a Kilkenny perspective in-house could be different to a, a Tipperary referee or a Cork referee. They just want to get to know what way they view the game. And even as something, if you go away from the rules, how a referee likes to be communicated to. You know, we've there's, there are some referees, and Paul will tell you, they're very difficult to talk to. You know, they're very difficult even to get an answer over, over a decision as to why they made that decision. But then you had referees like Barry Kelly, Oracle Horgan, who were who were brilliant. They, they'll tell you nearly play by play what the problem was. And at least you can get kind of nearly establish a rapport. Not too much rapport, but at least you, you, you find common ground and you can nearly know your limitations, what I can ask, what I can press, you know, mm-hmm. how hard I can question a decision. So I used to love that exercise. And I think it's something that probably will be carried forward. Yeah, it's no harm having good open communication with referees as well, because we were kind of debating away in the WhatsApp group before we uh, recorded the pod today about the amount of substitutions that were used in that game at the Gaelic grounds. And we were wondering about a concussion and whether that counts the same as a blood sub. Now, I just flicked off a quick text to Brian Gavin just to double check what the ruling was around it and then found out, which I didn't know that actually changed this rule, that a blood sub is now considered the same as concussion. So if a player goes off with a head concern and there's the possibility of concussion, you're not... Uh, maybe penalise is the right word it doesn't go into your standard substitution allotment so you're able to sub somebody off and bring someone else in for a concussion injury so it's actually handy Paul when you can actually go to a referee and check these things out I know we often think and it's difficult when they're you know amateur referees as well but in all sports I would love if there could be an openness that there is sometimes with the rugby officials where you could get an explanation from a referee about how they've interpreted something Yeah that's it you know I mean the transparency in the whole thing really just you know, I suppose it, it takes away from the small bit of anger that can surround things, you know, because often I think one of the things over the weekend that we saw, let's say, in the temporary double match, for example, was there was a little bit more confusion over some of the decisions and as to why they were made. And like, as you can see, it's, it's never the case in rugby. In rugby, we're generally 
you know, 100%, we understand what's after happening because we can hear the conversations. And I suppose that's, in one way, that's just down to the referees being mic'd up and different things, not saying that that's the route we should go down in the GA, but certainly when you understand, when a player understands what he's after doing or when a supporter understands what exactly is after happening. Um, and I suppose anything that dispels that bit of confusion, I think it can only be a benefit because the likes of the game, okay, it's, maybe it's a bad example, but Limerick Cork, um, over the weekend, you know, Sean Stack was in a tough position where, let's say, after Kingston um, went into high tackle and Sean Finn, straight away afterwards, he had a tough decision with Flanagan um, and he gave him a red card. But in, in, in that instance, you know, I think, to be honest, if, if he didn't send them off, there was, there was liability there for the, ca- for the game to actually get out of hand because lads get a little bit, you know, if he didn't send them off, there would have been players confused. Why didn't you send him off? He just sent off Kingston. So the confusion then can lead to a bit of anger. And I think similarly, point that we're making would be that any confusion can sometimes anger players because why did I get called for this? Why did I get pulled for that? That's one of the worst feelings as a player that you're not understanding what is the mechanism for why I'm being blown here. So really as an overall point, I think anything that that, that takes away from that confusion, be it with supporters or be it with players, like that, if it's a case of referee coming into dressing rooms or if it's a case that somehow we communicate the rules and what the referees are looking for a bit better as a whole, as a, as a GA community, I think anything that does that is, is only a positive. Well, that bit of spice and maybe a bit of edge that was there at the Gaelic grounds yesterday brings us around nicely to our first game to look at from the weekend. All-Ireland champions Limerick beaten again by Cork. Two goals and 19 points to one goal and 13. Uh, kind of a spectacular reversal from Cork of what happened in the All-Ireland final. They were further ahead at halftime than they were behind at Croke Park last year. Albeit, Limerick maybe won't be too unhappy when it was 14 versus 14 second half. They won the second half and maybe some of that we'll talk about in a moment was down to the changes and some of the more experienced players they brought back in. But James, Cork had something a little bit different about them yesterday, didn't they? Look, we saw the physicality, we saw the running, everything that we know that's good about this Cork hurling team. But they had a little bit of edge and bite about them and desire yeah. about that performance yesterday too. Like, Yeah, I agree. With, I, I, don't, uh, I don't compare yesterday's performance now to the Ireland because I just think in terms of progression in the year, it's kind of unfair. I'm comparing it back to when they played in the league last year. And with Limerick, Trons, Cork, and the Gaelic Grounds, and this was just a complete role reversal. Um, in terms of starters, you, you can't hide behind it and say, "Oh, Cork had 13 or 14 starters." They didn't. Cork had, I believe, nine max, ten starters. Ireland, Limerick had probably eight slash nine. So, in terms of balance, you know, there was a fair even even balance in terms of the first teamers. Um, and just Cork had a bit of um, they, they 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 had what we were looking for. They had that aggression, that spite, you know, that real kind of intent. Is why like and that that could be intense through running. Uh, running through lines that could be intense through support runners, that could be intense through tackles, through aggression, to fronting up with with there's a free and, a, and there's a couple of bodies in there, you know. And I really, really liked it. Um, I love the ingenuity with regards to Patrick Collins becoming a 15th outfielder. It kind of actually created a bit of problems. I love the fact that they kept switching play. Limerick have a have a have a habit of not a habit. I suppose they've they've mastered this stage whereby they go to the ball wherever the ball is and they can see the next the next phase. They can see where the ball is going to be passed and they're nearly honing in on that person before he even receives the ball, putting so undue pressure on that person. And I just like what Cork did yesterday. They just flipped the switch. They moved on the opposite side. Loved their forward formation with Horgan and with Barrett the way they did it, where they had one coming deep and one going wide. So if you look at the goal, that delivery comes from the um, from the five wing. I think it's Barrett or Kingston's coming, coming short. Horgan's gone the opposite direction. Ball comes in over. Horgan takes on his man and they've got runners coming through. Same with Lehan, same type of ball coming through and just real, real intent. I saw something from Lehan yesterday I haven't seen from that man in years. He first came on the scene in 2012. He was a whippet of a fella. Has pace. With a guy who has pace, you wouldn't normally associate with him of, get, of, of trying to elude people and, and kind of getting away from a tackle. Yesterday, he was taken on. He was getting stuck in. He was throwing a couple of slaps when, when normally that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be his style. He went up, catching puck outs. Again, I would, wouldn't have regularly have seen him gone with the hand. He's normally going with the hurl to bring it down to him. And uh, I just thought I saw something different from him yesterday. Cork are different um, this year. But for so far, so far they're, they're different this year. They've got a lovely balance. They've got a plethora of youth coming through, as we've seen with the under 20 teams. And um, God, they were fair. They were fair value for their victory yesterday. Limited to know what to do. You know? James, before I play Paul in on how Cork played, I just want to ask you about Patrick Collins a little bit more because he was almost like an extra, he's an extra outfield player. He was an extra distributor on the team as well, which actually gave them not just an edge against Limerick yesterday, because it's very useful when you've got a Limerick team who press. If you've got a goalkeeper who's comfortable in possession, is able to ping a few passes around. But it adds a little bit extra to Cork's attack to have a goalkeeper who's so good at distributing the ball as well. Brilliant. I mean, absolutely brilliant. And 
if you look at the way they play, so it's one thing being a seventh defender. Um, and like Paul said this, if, if you have the confidence in your goalkeeper that you can get the ball, throw it back to him and he'll split the play, get it away from your side, ASAP, that's great. But if you have the confidence to give it to your goalkeeper who will then set up an attack, you know, really and truly, it's not just about getting rid of the ball or delivering it, it's about getting the ball back to your goalie and, and trying to set up the next phase to ultimately result in a score. That's the whole what the name of the game is, you know. Yes, you've got to relieve pressure when you're under under duress at the back, but the way Patrick Collins can get the ball, I'd say he received the ball. This is a guess now on my behalf. 10, 12 times yesterday, easily in open play. And I don't think there was a negative play that came from it, you know, which is which is a fair testament to him. He's a beautiful striker. You know, I would, I would have thought last year he's kind of, he was kind of a slow striker. He's you know, trying to be too methodical. But my God, he's got some accuracy. And there's been, I did many instances yesterday with puck outs alike, whereby he'd hit a beautiful strike and it would just clear the opposition hurley by inches and, and it reach his target. And in contrast that with the opposite side, Hennessy, Barry Hennessy, who was his first game in a while, got cut out four times, wounded in three points, you know, it's just the dynamic between the two goalies was was different yesterday. And I think if Nicky was in goals yesterday, probably might have, I don't know what would much have changed, but it might have, you know, helped on the on the platform of going forward for Limerick. But I think Collins nominated for an All-Star next year, this year, or last year, excuse me. Um, and it seems like that he's kicked on a gear and I'd like to see him kick on a bit more. Paul, it's funny. You know, on the football real, pod, like nucleus, the cock team. I've no doubt, Paul, on the football pod right now, they're probably discussing the fact that goalkeepers got caught out who were trying to be a bit too clever with the ball <laughs> and their positioning at the weekend yeah. in the Gaelic football matches. Yeah. But right now, <laughs> we can talk about hurling goalkeepers who are very, very good at moving the ball around. And like, I think it's no coincidence that some of the really good modern goalkeepers play outfield for their club and are actually, you know, really comfortable with the ball in possession. Look at Kilkenny's goalkeeper with Owen Murphy. You know, he's one of the best passers of the ball around as a goalkeeper. Uh, a few miles up the road from you, Ender Roland in leash plays outfield for Abby Leakes, and he's almost like a quarterback when he gets the ball. And Leash have no problem going back to him and letting him start attacks again. We've moved on a long way, Paul, from once more time when the ball came back to your goalkeeper under any kind of pressure. You wanted him to puck it away as far from your goal as he possibly can. Yeah, completely. I mean, the role of the goalkeeper has completely changed, and I think it probably goes back to teams looking for that extra edge. You know, getting the maximum out of every single player on the pitch really every position and as we'll, we'll stick with goalkeepers but every position you know like when I started cornerback um, with Kenny, where it is when I left it was completely different in terms of where the game was at and what was expected of you and the type of ball you were given and all that that completely applies to goalkeepers now um, if you look at like you said with, with, with Owen Murphy for example he's centre back with his club and plays a huge and influential role won the intermediate this year end the role and again so many players what's expected is not just the case that you're there to I suppose be steady hands when the ball lands in that you have an enormous puck out. You have to be able to play the short game, the long game. You have to be able to catch a ball, work it out to the sides, dodge a few players, take a tackle, whatever. There's there's so much expected of you uh, in the position now. And I suppose teams are really seeing it for the value it can bring going forward. Um, like, you know, when, when you look at the way Cork used it over the weekend, and like James was saying, they use it to use usually positive effect. And I know they were, they were looking at, let's say, let's say Shawnee O'Shea, um, got a goal by chipping the goalkeeper because he was off his line. But I think if you're to trade it off, look, you're going to be taking risks by coming out a small bit like that. But like that, if 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 um if Collins got 12 balls yesterday and he used them all really well and he does the same in the next match, and okay, in, in, in a match this time he maybe gets caught out or something. I think the trade-off is sufficient there because going forward, you're 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 bringing a new dynamic into what you're doing at the backs. And suddenly now the six Limerick forwards are now outnumbered because there's seven Cork defenders who are actively playing the ball out of defence, which if, if each team applies that, and again, you know, Collins only came out a small bit. He didn't do a Stephen O'Keefe as before we would have seen him nearly close to the 45. But it's teams and it's goalkeepers are dabbling with this now for a position, seeing is there any traction to be gained? And look, at the bottom line, if you're bringing any inter-county goalkeeper out to his 21, if he decides there's nothing on in front of me and it's striking it long, the ball's going to land on the edge of the box on the far end, and that's guaranteed. And regardless of we're talking about short game and all this and possession games, that ball is is always going to be a dangerous ball. So what we're seeing with Collins, I think there's other teams dabbling with it as well, but I think we saw it to great effect, as James said yesterday, with, with Cork and Limerick. Paul, uh, do we get any way concerned about Limerick now? Because if we mirror it from last season, is it three games without a win like it was last year? But the one thing for Limerick is they've only scored 16 points a game. I had a quick look. Mm-hmm. That's the worst scoring rate of the teams in the top division this year. Do you get concerned at any stage that Limerick are slow starters purely because we are now less than two months away from when they play Cork on Easter weekend in the first game of the Munster Championship? Yeah, and, and that's, uh, that's the main point there that you're making as well, Will, is that 
you know, it, it's, a, it's a quicker turnaround this year, regardless how well you do in the league. It's a very quick turnaround. Before, let's say, if you did mediocre in the league, you could be looking at a six or eight week layoff to get your house in order before you enter championship. But that, that turnaround now at the moment is very quick. I think significant over the weekend, we, we now, well, I would certainly say there's a little bit of concern for Limerick. Now, again, are they still the favourites for the All Ireland? Of course they are. Will they have a huge year? I'm sure they'll get things back on track and so on. But I think what John Kiley's looking at at the moment, I mean, you saw at half time, he took off four lads and put on four of his strongest lads. And for me, what that's significantly saying is he's given chances to the lads who are on the panel. Supposedly, they have this enormously strong panel. But are they showing it on the pitch? Well, at the moment, you'd say they're not showing it on the pitch. And if you have to keep going back, like Will O'Donoghue came on, and you could see the, the attitude of Will O'Donoghue when he came on at halftime. He was, like, we talk of him of being, being this enforcer, but the role that he holds in the field in terms of dominating that area, Limerick didn't dominate it over the weekend. And if they keep having to go back to the same lads, you know, your Declan Hannans, your Richie Englishes, and all these lads, you have, being Graham Mulcahy being brought on, if, you know, if Graham Mulcahy retired last year, he wouldn't have been surprised. But if you keep having to go back to these lads, I think that's where the concern is now laying with Limerick. If you look at the inside forward line that started, two points from play yesterday, OK, regardless, Seamus Flanagan was sent off before half time. But if you look at Cork, they got about 2-4 from play. Their inside forward line throughout the game. So these are the things, if you look at any of the teams that won over the weekend, these are the scores that teams were racking up from their inside forward line. You could look at it then and say maybe the forward line aren't working, but what type of ball is coming in? Limerick, their decision-making was very poor over the weekend. Traditionally, the ball they would have got and popped it off and worked it right up, made the Cork backs come out on top of them. They were just flinging it in. And to be honest, like, you know, they, they were relying on their full forward line in a bit of a foot race. Um, so I think there is a few things there now that we're saying, well, this is three matches in a row. There's no smoke without fire, you know. So there is a few bits. Again, is it alarm bells ringing? No, it's not. But... At this stage, I think it'd be foolish to say there is a few things or to say that there's not things that Limerick need to work on. There definitely is. And the one fear I think, I suppose, Limerick need to sort out is that this doesn't eat into the confidence of the team, that they've now went and played three games and significantly bet by Galway. They've went away to Wexford and now Cork have come up onto their own patch and given them a big beating and also gotten their face as well, like bullied them as well. So I think there's a few things there you can talk about. Again, it's not alarm bells, but there is a few red flags for them. Yeah, James, I guess the things they probably have to have a look at, like Casey's missed in that forward line, most definitely, yeah. and adding a bit of a different dimension to it. And as Paul mentioned, when you've got Burns, Galan, O'Donoghue coming off the bench at half time, that sends a fairly clear signal. It's like, I've given players a chance, but here comes the heavy artillery to try and rescue this game in the second half, which comes back to a point that we had on the first weekend, which was we haven't seen a huge amount outside of, say, 20 or so players that Limerick have used in the last few years. Like he sticks to a very, very certain formula with this Limerick team. And maybe we haven't seen a huge amount in the heat of battle from some of those backup players. Yeah, like I think obviously with a successful team, it probably can be tricky to synchronize the whole panel to make sure that numbers one to 35 are all uh, consistently performing, are content in their position and are all pushing forward. So when you've got, let's say, one to 16, one to 17, who will be regular players for Limerick, then maybe thir- the, the number 18 to 35 can get a bit itchy and they're kind of probably having little conversations with management looking for a chance or looking for kind of little kind of dropping hints, put me in, give me, give me a go. And then it's a case of put up or shut up. You know, all you want is the chance. And when you get your chance, if you, do, if you don't, uh, if that doesn't um, materialize the way you want it, that's, that's on the player. That's not on the manager. So like for lads who have come in yesterday or, or the last week, the week prior, they've been given chances. They had sufficient time to make an impact in the game. And it just didn't transpire that way. And you look at Paul mentioned, well, I don't know, I've, I've noted here as well, he is, he is first break um, cap- capability. So what that is, he gets the ball straight away, he's going forward for the black spot and he breaks, he always breaks the first tackle. Look at the platform that he gives Limerick going forward. That in the first tackle wasn't there whatsoever. You know, normally Limerick, they do a great phase play with the, by the bringing back Hannon and does another pass, let's say, within a 30, 40 mil, uh, meter distance. Then it's hit into Flanagan and hit into Casey. On, on, a, on a plate basically and they have open time just to get and throw over the bar that didn't happen yesterday that platform wasn't there for Limerick yesterday it didn't happen against Galway it didn't happen against Wexford solely because teams have kind of I won't say they've copped on you know they've certainly developed a plan on how to counter at Limerick as best they can get in their face early get on the ball get tacklers get numbers around them and cut off that middle zone with the crossing, beam, crossing balls coming over I, from the way if Limerick are to execute their plan they need their best players on the pitch and I just I, again if they win the Ireland this year they're going to win it with 18-19 that's just the reality of it you know, I think in, in addition to last year, they've lost Casey, but they've probably gained Cahill O'Neill, who looks, who looks like a real find, you know. And beyond that, it's very easy to talk to them. You know what I mean? Like, you, you'll still have your 17 or 18 players. So I think you'll see, it could be, 
I was I was thinking you might see a different Limerick this year. I don't think I think you'll see more of the same. Um, I had a lad telling me yesterday <laughs> that uh, last night basically that the water break they've lost the water break now that Paul Kinnor can't get his tactics in place. That's just pure BS. It's just a simple fact that they're probably a couple of weeks behind every other team because of holidays and vacays and whatnot, and they'll catch up. I think when when the engine starts rolling again and they head into April May, you'll see a different animal, but with the same clientele. Yeah, I mean, obviously that's facetious, uh, the line on the water breaks coming from that supporter who was chatting to James Paul, but is, is there anything in it that, uh, you know, the, Limerick were one of the teams that used the water breaks best as a coaching break because they had these, um, you know, plastic tactic boards that Canerk used to get onto the pitch and they did use that minute or two minutes very effectively, but I'm sure that hasn't had all that much of an influence, really. No, I don't think so. Like, uh, there's there's a few consistent points. Like, one that I noticed that it's, it's consistent with the three matches is and, and it's something that Limerick really have to be wise to, which I don't think they're wise to yet, is teams are going out and getting in their faces, and it's a game plan. It's not a case of like a team are up for it and they happen to start getting each other's faces. Teams are going out to get under the skin of Limerick, and Limerick are buying it at the moment, which is a big thing for them. Like, I mean, you see lads going out and they're poking with the hurls in their mouth, and I think Tom Morrissey was fouled over the weekend. Now, in fairness, Tom Morrissey is clever, and he turned and he walked away, but there was other Limerick lads going to get involved. Um, I think O'Donovan pushed another fellow away, or someone, you know, you could see lads going in foolishly, but if I'm saying to myself, this is what the Cork lads want to be doing, and we've seen it in each game, Galway were getting right up in their faces, Wexford were getting in their faces, and it's taken Limerick's mind off what the job in hand. And like, you know, if Limerick want to shut them up, stick the ball in the net and see will he come up there and get into your face in the next one, put the ball over the bar, do your job. But at the moment, you know, even we saw something, and I, I hate to be critical of Declan Hannon, one of the nicest fellas and best herders in the game, but you know, he got a free over for the week. He got a free. Cork player went yeah. in a bit high and he reacted and he, he hit the hurl into him. And now Cork player hit the deck as well, which I was kind of saying he went down soft. And he, but he was also trying to sell it to the ref to maybe get Hannon sent off. But either way, Hannon left himself open there. If he was sent off because of it, he could have counted himself lucky, you know, or unlucky maybe. But um, but this is something Limerick can kind of have to be aware of that there's you know this is something that's going to be deployed on them week on week. And if they keep buying it week on week, well they're going to be they're going to be putting themselves in a bad place. They need to learn to. Okay, teams are going to come out. We have to expect this every single week. Expect it, and a bit of ice on the brain. I mean, it's just headless stuff. If consistently we're getting lads sent off, three games and two lads sent off, it's a little bit headless. Yeah, the other thing as well, Paul. When we go back to Cork, some of their players are just in really good form. I'm thinking of mm-hmm. Kieran Joyce here. Like we talk about Patrick Horgan's scoring all the time, but I actually thought yesterday watching the game. His contribution outside of that was really good. He made some really good off-the-ball running uh, during the game. He created space for the players around him. And Cork were able to just run through the middle so many times against that Limerick team. They've got players who have started this season in really, really good form. They have, yeah. And and, and I suppose significantly what the forward line are doing, which is a big help. And we'll see it, I suppose, we'll talk about it maybe with Tipperary going forward. It's just something I noticed over the weekend that... Look, the way the game has gone at the moment, a lot of lads be asking about this direct ball and what way are we working it through the lines... If you're working the ball through the lines, which every team really should be doing at the moment and mixing it with that long ball, you need your half forward line coming out and looking for that ball. Because if the half forward line aren't coming, if you're trying to get your ball from in between your own 45 and 65 to the other half forward line, if they're not coming looking, it's no good. And we're talking about how did Cork run the ball through the Limerick, uh, in, in through the middle of the Limerick defence. They always had the option of a lad off the shoulder or half forward line, Conor Lee Han or someone coming looking for it which that was significant because there was two outs and if neither of them were there at the time, they hit the ball in long. So they were actually, it was really a Limerick game is what they were playing against against Limerick, you know. But if you look at the Tipperary match, and no, we'll get to it. Tipperary were saying with this kind of longer ball kind of directly, we'll get the ball into Jake Morris, we'll get the ball in. Cork weren't doing that. Cork were consistently running the ball, running the ball. And then when they were getting up into a really scorable position around the 45, popping it over the bar. But they weren't afraid either to maybe get it into the full forward line, work it in really well, give the full forward a chance Chances none, recycle it, get the ball over the bar. So just, like we were here last week talking about Cork saying, you know, they didn't lay a hand on Limerick in the final. We don't know what Cork we're going to get. Cork can do this every week to go out. And I've no doubt about it. They have the hurlers. And something significant, a fellow we haven't overly mentioned yet, or, well, James mentioned, Conor Lehan. When Conor Lehan first came onto the scene, I was saying to myself, I'm, this lad's going to cause me nightmares for years. And he slowly, you know, at times he didn't perform. And at times he played Cork, he could destroy it. And there was other times where he just wasn't there. And I was always nearly thanking God saying he wasn't there because the power and the speed that he brings to that full forward or to that forward line in general is immense. And I was delighted, to be honest, over the weekend to see what he brought to it. I think he deserves it, to be honest. He's a very genuine, very honest player. And he chipped in with two points, but the hard work he was doing all over the pitch, he was taken off after 45 minutes. 
and he was man of the match and as, as far as I was concerned for what he contributed to the game for Cork and having the likes of him back I just think you know it's invigorated that forward line again because they all know how good he is and what he brings to it but I think he just brought that bit more of energy again to that Cork um, half forward line which again asked ask questions of that Cork back line and even opened it up just or the, the limit back line it just opened it up a small bit so like I really really liked what I saw from Cork but again Similar enough, what we said last week is they have to back this up now. They have to go out and do it again. They, they can do it every week if they want, but will they do it every week is really the question with Cork. Right, James. To back it up this week, they'd have to beat Galway at Porky Cueve. Galway coming off the back of a defeat which you were watching in Salt Hill against mm-hmm. Wexford yesterday. Wexford getting out by a couple of goals in the end, uh, two goals and 15 points to 15 points. What did you see from Galway on your first league game that you got to see them at home this year? God, how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> Take it. It's the joy of a podcast, James. You can talk for as long as you want. Yeah, God, I don't know. Look, I, 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 again, with, with as we said about Cork and we said about Limerick, the, the full starting team wasn't there. You know, there were probably eight or nine fellows that we would be classed as regular starters. Um, and that, uh, I, but the same could be Wexford, similar position. You know, that Kevin Forley was back, Lee Chin was out, you know, Carl McDonald was out, Liam Ryan was out. So they started off even keel as far as I'm concerned. Um, the games, it, it lacked a bit of energy from Galway's perspective. You know, Wexford seemed to have more pace. They seemed to have more intent. Um, they seemed to be collectively together knew what they were doing, like there was more balance. So if a Wexford guy was penetrating the line, he had two, three, four guys beside him, you know, um, offering support. Off, too, too often we had Galway, let's say, who, who guys had to kind of create something on an individual basis. There was no real kind of, how do you say, team set up play. Uh, Cahal Manning at 14 was starved. I think he's just too influential to be in there. We missed Conor Whelan too much. He's like, He's like a two-man for forward line by himself. His his tackling ability is so ferocious. Um, and then when you take Cotton Manion's, yeah, I suppose, uh, imprint on the game out of it, you know, it just it, it created a lot of indi- individual displays. It was discouraging, to be honest. Um, and if you're a Wexford supporter, you'd be encouraged coming away from it. Um, and I thought the game was there to be won. To be honest, well, the, the, it was a six-point loss for Galway. It wasn't a six-point d- uh, difference in the teams. That was for sure. Galway drew level, Conor Cooney, uh, we dispossessed a puck out, Conor Cooney had a chance to go one up, it went wide, ball goes down, Dark Fahey makes a great save, next thing is blocked down uh, under clearance with no pressure, uh, it's a point for Wexford, and then Dahi uncharacteristically um, looking up for a pass, he obviously didn't see something on, that's why he went back to his goalkeeper, the goalkeeper brought it back to Dahi, still nothing on, so I, the question remains was, who's coming back from midfield, where are the halfbacks supporting him, who's giving Dahi options if we're playing this possession game, but then Dahi was forced to do kind of a cross-field ball. And everyone, like the, the nine-tenths of people would look at Dahi and go, oh, it was, his, it was his issue that the reason he got locked down. For me, looking at it on a broader scale, there was no option. And that's more worrisome than, than an individual error that caused a goal. If you're wanting a team to play a possession game, you need less to come back. You need, you need three, your three halfbacks, your two midfielders, forwards, coming back into that area, looking for that ball so they can shift it up to the big pitch above. And that just wasn't there from Galway. Um, but like that, I'm, am I concerned? I'm probably not, to be honest. You know, I... I was I was hoping for a, a kind of a, a step up again, let's say, for Galway to kick on, to show more consistency, and put put three wins in a bounce. That didn't happen. Um, but like the, I won't say they go back to the drawing board. They certainly have things to work on. But uh, it was a, a discouraging performance for sure. Yeah, I'm glad you brought Conor Whelan straight away because him not being there seemed to make a massive difference for Galway. Like we're complimenting how well the forwards are working the week before. You take him out, and then you're robbing Peter to pay Paul to move other lads around. Yeah, like his ability, like, it's actually hard to communicate this to people how good he is in attacking. So you'd be doing these drills, like, and sometimes the goal is to be throwing the drills as well for tackling for some reason. But you'd be doing drills with him, and he's like a dog growler. That, that's, that's no word of a lie. He's doing this, uh, uh, get, trying to get the ball. Do you know what I mean? He's in there, and he's so low to the ground, and he's taking two lads. You can't shove him off it. He's got a pair of quads in him like a rubber player, and he's got, he's got such energy in a tackle. Paul, I'll tell you. When you run after a fella, you're tackling for 20 seconds, 30 seconds. Your air, your gas goes as fast as anything. You know, he's able to maintain that pace, that ferocity of a tackle for a minute, you know, a minute and a half, which is crazy when you think of a fitness level. And so he's back and forth when you're mixing up, you know, attacking runs. So he's running back and forth the pitch looking for the ball. Next thing the ball doesn't come to him. Now he's running to go tackling fella. He's able to sustain that energy for 70 minutes. It's amazing. And that, that loss was really felt yesterday because that, that tackling presence, that... That really, as I say, ferocity tackle just wasn't there from Galway. Go on, Paul. Tell us about how much of a nightmare it is getting ready to go near Conor Lahan. How tricky would it be to go near Whelan if he's in uh, the kind of mood like an angry dog that James <laughs> yeah. just described there? Yeah, look, Conor Whelan is just one of these forwards. Like, I, I've, I've, I suppose, great time for Conor in terms of, um, I don't really know the fella now, like, but uh, 
in terms of just coming across him over the years, like I first came across him in 2015 when we played him in the Leinster final final that, around then. Um, and he was, you know, he, you could see he was a good young hurler and he was a bit obviously lighter as he was then. But, you know, through the years, you could just see as well, he was developing physically into a, into a real serious player. No one ever doubted the, the amount of hurling he has. But, yeah, like, I mean, anytime we used to face Galway, like, of course, you'd have to say, right, lads, Joe's going to be out centre forward. Who's taking Joe? Or he might be in full forward. But there was always a real question of, as who's taking Conor Healy, who's taking him? Because he's the anchor, really, as far as we could see it from we were playing Galway for that forward line. Because he, he's a great ball winner in terms of, you see a lot of forwards going out attacking the ball, let's say, with, with, let's say a lad going out with Paddy Marr or whatever. You know, Paddy Marr is on his back and the forward finds it very hard to create that space. But Conor Healy was always a fella, because he's so physically strong, he spreads the arms. He can take the ball, you know, into the hand very low down on the ground. He can win a ball high in the air, but he creates that distance and that space between him and the defender by just spreading the shoulders. And he doesn't need very much space to knock the ball over the bar. A lot of other forwards kind of need the conditions to be right for him to, I suppose, hit the ground. And, OK, Conor Healy, he mightn't be a fella who will contribute, you know, one ten of a day or, or, or light up. But he, he makes that ball stick when it goes into a full forward line. And similar enough, like we're mentioning Cahill Mannion there, I was disappointed to see Cahill Mannion inside that corner forward because we talked about it last week. Bring him out. You know, he finds it a little bit tougher to operate, I think, myself in a corner forward. He hasn't that physicality about him. He probably needs the space where he can run onto the ball. But the job that we look at Conor Whelan to do or that Galway look for Conor Whelan to do, very few lads in the country can do it as well as him. Um, and it's something as well that is might seem as maybe a small thing, but his balance in terms of he gets the ball and he turns and takes on, he has great speed, but no one can knock him off balance. He usually just creates that bit of distance out towards the sideline over the bar. So what he does there, you could see it was, it was evident in abundance yesterday that it was just missing for Galway because, and I think more so, if you look at the scores, what Conor Whelan often does is he wins the ball and then there's lads running, you know, Evan Island or whoever's off the shoulder. But now these lads had to go and win a little bit more ball because he wasn't there over the weekend. So it was evident really for for um, for Galway not having him. Paul, going from one forward who we're talking about that wasn't available for this weekend to a player who's become available for the last two, and that's Rory O'Connor for Wexford, who's hurling out of his skin. I was wondering how long it was going to take him when you're looking at a forward who's so pacey and so much about the dynamic movement that sometimes when you come back from a muscle injury, it can take a game or two to find your flow. Played very well against Clare and was excellent against Galway. He got three points in the first half, ends with five, and he was crucial in so many of Wexford's attacks yesterday. Yeah, he was, yeah. And, and and again, like he's just a player who's really developing and he just seems completely, I suppose, comfortable. And again, I, this maybe goes back to a bit of Darry Egan as well in terms of Darry Egan, for me, looks like he's after outlining Rory O'Connor's job to him. It's like, this is your job. And with the likes of Rory O'Connor, what I'd be kind of saying to him is, you do what you want to do. He's that kind of player. Like you go where you feel you need to go. You get that breaking ball. If you, you're playing, let's say, a right half forward, if you want to go drift in towards left corner forward or you're coming out towards midfield, you do that. And it seems he has that license at the moment. And like you said, you know, we're talking about other players chipping in in different games. Rory Connor came out with five points, one from free. Like that's that's exactly what you're looking for your forwards to do in any game. And the variety as well of the scores he got, like some were, you know, down near the 21 towards the sideline that you don't expect him to get it. You nearly give out to some forwards if they went for it, but the kind of confidence that he's in, you'd let him do it. Another one, I think, was in the first half there in the first 15 minutes. You know, he was running towards the sideline, 45 over the shoulder, great point. And like up in Galway, that's not easy to do with whatever wind you import up there. It's it's a very hard thing to do. But um, or not that I've ever attempted it even. But no, in terms of for for you know for Wexford, um it's brilliant to have someone like that. Maybe they've looked at you know the likes of Lee Chin and Conor McDonald and all these. You, you always want to have someone else bringing something different to the table. And Rory O'Connor just gets through a huge amount of work and look a really strong performance from, like you said, coming back from injury. That's no mean feat to be doing that. So a great performance. And he was really, I suppose he was the standout man really in, in what was like, like James said, a game that was maybe lacking real massive intensity. It was intense to a certain degree, but there was nothing that really lit up the day. So Rory O'Connor was probably the shining light through all that. James, you got to see him in person. What was your take on his performance? Yeah, I just kept, I, I wrote down, let's say, I, his fitness looks good. He was doing these penetrated runs. Paul made a great point there. He had number 15 on his back, but it was just like he was given lights to, to go and, and make something happen, make a bit of hay for whatever way he felt necessary. And I think that's kind of like a sweet spot for Rory Connor. Like if he can find a balance whereby he's given just enough, I suppose, of a game plan to follow and just enough of a pattern to play, mix that with his own intuition, his own initiative, you know, the, what he sees in front of him, like that you're going to get dangerous Rory Connor. In terms of influence, if you think about Lee Chin, Connor McDonald, Rory O'Connor, 
who will offer the most influence if you give them a free reign? And I think it's, it's, it's Rory. You know, really and truly, it is Rory. He, he'll give something a bit more than what others can. So, like, five points in play was amazing. In my view, he created the goal. He just, he, he saw where the ball was going to break. He said he was going to come down contested, and he just chanced. He chanced a run in front, and he got, got there first, took it on, and created the opportunity for, for a goal score. And he just looked really confident, you know, and um, he was untouchable. That was like always fastest back, Adrian Tuhi, you know, who's, who's really quick, couldn't catch him yesterday. You know, that shows you what kind of the pace he has. He looks very strong. And like he's, he's a key man for Wexford. I think above anybody else, you know, I know we talk great about Lee Chin and Conor Dunn, but above anybody else, Rory Connor's the man. If they're going to go anywhere this year, he's got to be number one in firing all cylinders. I wonder as well, James, will there be a temptation to allow Lee Chin to play a little bit deeper and maybe in midfield? if Dar Egan feels he's going to get enough of a scoring return from his forward line, because some of the temptation with Chin being moved to a kind of a number 11 shirt or trying to get him into attack was just adding an extra scoring thread a bit closer to goal. In theory, if Conor McDonald and Rory O'Connor particularly on form and the other lads chip in a bit with scores, maybe it might be more beneficial when Chin is back and fit to have him more towards the middle of the field than half forward this year. Yeah, I, I think for we, 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 we've often spoken about goalies about being quarterbacks. That, that's generally quarterbacks nine times out of ten in a, in a dead play, dead ball situation, you know, puck out, etc. Then you've got the quarterbacks who are out the field, you know. And I looked at like Dublin yesterday, uh, or on Saturday, Saturday evening, excuse me, and I saw Danny Sutcliffe, and like he got 11 possessions behind his own 65, you know. So he's like the quarterback out the field. So basically, if you're playing this possession game where you're trying to create cross field space for your 13 or 15, you're not trying to basically create a blockade for your forwards going through, you're going to have to pull back your half forwards, as Paul said, come get the ball. And then try to deliver it into a quality ball into a forward who could have the danger of Rory Connor. Lee Chin kind of offers that for me. Has he got the pace to take on 50 yards? He probably doesn't. You know what I mean? He's definitely got the skill, the strength, and he's got two great sides to deliver a quality ball into forward. So I think there's something there. I probably would still see him as a number 10 or a number 11 coming a bit deeper, you know, like a Dan Morris type role, Danny Sutcliffe type role. That's where I keep him. I don't think I put him in a midfield role because that's just nowadays that's just a different job entirely. You know, midfield is kind of box to box nowadays. It's a very difficult role. It's really for you know kind of a fitness orientated type of person these days, uh, and I just think Chin, where do you get the most out of him? You get the most out of him when he's on the ball. Simple as that. So get him on the ball, put him at ten, put him at eleven, put him in the thick of the action, and a bit like Barry Connor, give him a license to see what he can do fit. Paul, would you keep him in the, inst- the half forward line? I should say. Um, yeah, look, there's there's there are arguments for both really. I suppose it just depends on what way Dar Egan wants to approach in terms of the way he's setting up. We see Wexford at the moment. And um, again, like we're saying, we're, we're talking about them week on week here that they're mixing it up um, with the way they're moving the ball. Again, we've seen with other teams, with Watford, um, you know, they, they put Shane Bennett back at centre back, a traditional corner forward, half forward. But they saw that as a launching pad for him going forward. That the way the game has gone at the moment, you could potentially go from centre back, push forward, and get your scores there and just get on a lot of ball. The way Paddy Foley's hurling, there's absolutely no need to be putting, disrupting that and throwing him in there. But I think certainly, like, you know, James makes a fair point there. You're two midfielders at the moment. They're generally the lads you need. You're telling them flood back, flood back. I think there's a point to put Lee Chin, maybe wing forward, drift between centre forward, whatever. But tell him maybe sit that bit deeper and provide that good ball going forward. Um, you know, again, w- when we would have played Wexford, the way I would have always seen Lee Chin having a massive effect on the game would have been once you got him, you gave him good possession facing towards your goal as opposed to him running back trying to win possession and having to come back up the pitch. If you got him as opposed to this truck and trailer job of, you know, if someone wins the ball and Chin is off the shoulder and he's running towards goal, he's savagely dangerous then. We all know how, how, how impressive he is in the air as well. But I think it's something for Darry Egan, and, which is a good way maybe to come at it is Lee Chin's not involved at the moment and they're taking over really well. So I think Darry Egan can look at this go, where can I slot Lee Chin in here? That Where are we maybe missing a little bit of an edge? Is it maybe up the channels? Is it, you know, get Chin to start at 10, maybe for 15 minutes till him drop in towards midfield and pull that half back out you know there's a few options there for Dar Egan but I think it's a good headache to have that you're sitting where you are with three wins you don't have Lee Chin you know you have Rory O'Connor flying you have lads popping up at scores Paddy Foley sitting really well at centre back it's the best position he could possibly be in as opposed to having faced the league where Lee Chin is front and centre I haven't really learned a whole lot about everyone else around him Dar Egan is really in an ideal position now to decide well, what job do I see Lee Chin filling for the summer just to round off Division 1A, Clare have got Limerick this week, which is a, a different type of test for them. But uh, as an awfully supporter, once I saw the team sheet come out on Friday with Clare and I saw that Tony Kelly was down to start in the team, I was hoping maybe this is trying to spook, maybe he's not going to play. He plays and he scores two goals and 12 points. He 
comes to life, particularly in the game when they needed him. Because 50 minutes gone in that game, Clare were just up by one point. It was a draw at half time. But Tony Kelly comes straight back in, Paul, two goals and 12 points. And in the end, that proved to be the difference maker between themselves and Offaly. And Clare have got that win now to get them up and running ahead of hosting their neighbours this weekend. Yeah, look, I mean, again, it's 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 great when I see Tony back. Of course, we all want to see Tony playing. And it's brilliant, but like, I still like Tony Kelly isn't going to solve Clare's problems either. Like, he'll get them out of ruts and he'll he'll do this Ryder over stuff that will get them over the line. But you know, the rest of the Clare players need to be looking at it going like this fella will come back and he contributes what he did over the weekend. Um, brilliant. But what are the rest of us doing to really contribute here? Like, it's I suppose it's a good way for them to be going into the Limerick match. Okay, they're hosting their near neighbours. The pressure's on Limerick really to perform in this. I don't think anyone's expecting Clare to beat them. But certainly, you know, if Clare could look at this as a big scalp, okay, we have Tony Kelly back now. This is the position, this is our best position we're going to be in, you know, give or take for the summer. So let's take a fair scalp at a Limerick team who mightn't be expecting a scalp to be taken. So I think that could be a match the weekend now that we maybe like we might look at other ones there, the likes of Kilkenny and Dublin as a good one, the two teams in form and so on. But there could be a, a bit of skin and hair flying, I think, in that one over the weekend, because again, you know, okay, Clare have won, uh, have won one match now, but they, they have to really step it up a small bit more. Can't be relying on Tony Kelly. But Limerick, you know, Limerick have to start winning matches now as well, and they have to, I suppose, stem the tide of, of the performance that they've been putting in. So it might be one that's, I suppose, a small bit of a sidebar, but I think there could be a bit to be learned from it over the weekend. But again, Clare, look, again, like you said, they didn't push away from Offaly earlier on like other teams have been doing, and that's no offence to Offaly. Relying on Tony Kelly the whole time, it'll get you so far during the year, but they need to they need to come to the table with something else. James, is this a good or a bad time for Clare to play Limerick then, given that Limerick will be hurting from the three defeats and now they know time is running out in the league that they need to get a few results, or is it a good time to play them given that Limerick aren't at all cylinders just yet? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's I think it's a good time to be honest. Um I think there will be a kickback in Limerick. Uh for, for Clare, I think over the course of the weekend it was just about getting a result. Um it was the type of game, no disrespect to Offaly that I think winning, coming away from that game with two points, no injuries, and moving on to the next step was the most important thing for Clare. <clears throat> it was a 50-minute game, as you, as you could say. Again, for Michael Finley, the opposite side, trying to bring in a consistent performance and probably his target. But for Brian Lowen, he's saying, get two points, no injuries, move on to Limerick, and let's, let's, let's have a really hard, hard contested game in, in, uh, in us. I, are they going to beat Limerick? I would say no at this stage. You know, Have they got the tools that, let's say, go away and court provided to beat Limerick, which is the complete physicality? mixed with kind of hurling execution. I just don't see it clear at the minute. And um, Paul is 100 percent right. Tony Kelly, you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer. Like he's yes, he's a highly influential player. He's a super talent, but he can be, you know, I suppose marshaled by one or two guys in in a hot middle third there if he's playing a Lear making championship, if he's playing a Tipperary championship. So they're going to have to try and get a more spread of, of influence over the course of, of 70 minutes, over the course of the year even. Um, so I think it's going to be an interesting game. If I was a clear supporter, I'd be just looking for a, a hotly contested a 17 minute performance whereby we're just going to okay put the score aside for a moment but just contest the game against Lim- Limerick front up attack everything that you, can, that, that you have to go against Limerick and, and see where it takes you that's, that's all that clear players or, or clear supporters can ask for at the moment because beyond that everyone's just is pying the sky stuff don't mind I can take all the disrespect you've just given awfully both of you by saying no disrespect awfully over the last two with the defeats that have happened so far but I, look I still think my stance going into the league was it's better for Offaly to be playing even in this very difficult Absolutely. division in 1A yeah. than playing in 2A against teams that were beaten last year in the league if they're going to be in a good position going into the Joe McDonough. And I'll give the 2A results in a moment. That division, God knows who's going to come out of it this year. Yeah. They're all beating each other so far. Uh, we'll go down to 1B then because, you know, Paul, we mentioned Waterford are still unbeaten so far in this league or motoring along nicely. They made a few changes for Antrim. Just about got over the line. I saw the Neil McManus penalty right at the end where Antrim could have potentially got the two points. They've now given Dublin a good run. They've given Waterford a good run at home as well. Corrigan Park has proven a very difficult place for any team to go. It, it is, yeah. And there's been very little in it for, for Antrim. I actually, you know, a lot of narrative around the Antrim Waterford matches that, you know, as I saw one headline saying that it saved Waterford's blushes. Look, I don't think there's any blushes to be, you know, when playing Antrim, they're a savage team, like, you know, and they've gotten big scalps off Wexford, off Clare. Um, you know, the way McManus has played, they're a very good organised team. They're very strong. A few small things in those games and they would have come away with a result, you know. Um, so I don't think there's any blushes to be spared there. They put in a savage performance. They Again, Corrigan Park, like I said, it's not an easy place to go. So in, again, from a water point of view, that's a great positive. Um, the game ebb, ebbed and flowed. Uh, I suppose unfortunately there wasn't much coverage on the television either because it, it proved to be a very good game. But... Look, again, it's a big one for Waterford again because Waterford, 
you know, they've, they've gone to Parnell Park, they've put in a big performance with Bally Gunner players, they've gone up to Corrigan Park, other teams have been scalps taken off them up there, but, you know, they've come away with the win. So, look, Antrim will be disappointed that they're not getting, I suppose, as many results as they did last year up in Corrigan Park, but nevertheless, look, they'll know themselves that there was very little in these games, and maybe, I suppose, a few more chances taken during the game as opposed to leaving it to the death, and, you know, they could be coming away with a draw or a win, and again, you have that momentum going again. But look, Antrim are putting in big performances. They're not lying down against teams. They're putting it up to teams. And they're playing a great brand of hurling. They're, they have they're really strong good players. They don't really have much of a tail on the team. And I suppose where they do, they work really well as a unit, in, in defensively, certainly. And their fitness levels are very high. And like again, they have this great aggression that a lot of teams can be criticised for not having. They, the Antrim lads have it. So... Look, it was a, I suppose it was a touch and go match, and Waterford will be they'll certainly be happy coming out of Corrigan Park. There, um, they know it could have just easily been a draw, but look, it was a good win for them. And I, I, I saw Neil McMahon has been interviewed. He said, "Look, it's probably another one we felt we left behind." So look, that's an insight into the way the Antrim lads are looking at it. They're not looking as a moral victory. They're saying we should be winning these matches we want to, which is a great way to have these Antrim teams competing. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of Waterford last year where they were sluggish against Westmead and then it didn't affect the rest of their performances in the league. That sometimes you have a day where the result is all that matters much more so than the performance. And for Antrim, James, really their big league game and the one they would have targeted from the start of the league is this coming Sunday. They go to Leash in Port Leash where realistically, whoever loses that game come about half past five on Sunday afternoon are probably going to be in a relegation playoff against Offaly realistically. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think probably from, from an Antrim perspective, you're right. They would have looked at that game and said, look, if we get two points here, we're relatively safe. Um, I think from Antrim, I have to just touch on them. They, they've grown over the last, you know, 18, 24 months under Gleeson. Because in years previous, like, and Paul will tell you, this has been on a strike. When you play Antrim, your main, I suppose, objective was to silence them early. Don't let them into the game. Don't give them an opportunity to, to grow into a game. Kind of get rid of them early. That, 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 I'm trying to say that now in a nice way, whereby 15, 20 minutes sink a couple of goals and get rid of them and they'll, they'll die a death, right? That has completely changed. So that's gone now with Antrim, which is great to see from a hurling perspective. I, mean, I think nationally, everyone wants Antrim to do well because they seem to be they're the best Northern representative in the game. And I think for going forward, if, if they can keep top-level experience in the management role, i.e. Gleason, going forward, they can build. They have the tools to build there and who knows where they can be in a year or two. Because it's not too long ago, there was a certain man looking to get an Ulster team put into a championship, you know, so yeah, can, I, can I, we kill that right now? That there's there's no killed, point in having an Ulster team. Like, like Antrim them, yeah. are now getting closer to the top nine than when they were when those conversations were happening. Like, like Antrim should yeah. have their own team. Yeah, forget about it. Ulster team. Yes, it was probably that was probably a television statement. If I'm honest, you know, mm. um, at the time probably on the back of a big beating, you know. So I think forget about that. There's too much good work being done in every county. I know we're talking about Antrim because they're in the top division at the moment. But to take let's say down like who were. You know, they're, they're going, they're in third yesterday in Division 2A. They're going, they're trying. Donegal Gall have always tried. So this is across the board, across the north. And what they need is assistance. You know, they need funding. They need assistance. They need top-level coaches. Um, probably more top-level coaches, should I say, from, from the big counties to go up and kind of assist this. That's the kind of impression I think Leeson has put onto Antrim. So instead of saying we should join one up and just make one, one token team, they should all be at least given the, the, the due respect to try and grow themselves within the county. You know, because they all have a good club game by all accounts. So... Um, I know I went on a bit about Antrim there and we got digressed, but I just, I'm happy to see them because when you talk to all the Antrim players, Neil McManus, he's the same age as myself, you know, really good guy. Hurling is his life, do you know what I mean? He'll, he'll stay playing top level hurling until his legs give out entirely, which could be his 40 years of age, Tony Brown kind of stuff. And I, I just, I'd love to see him get a big victory in a championship or a big victory in a league off a, off a, t- a tier one team. I'd love to see him take down a Kikini or a chip or a I won't say Galway or Cork, do you know what I mean? Just for themselves, you know, <laughs> to, to prove that the efforts they're putting in over the course of the years, you know, are coming to fruition. You know, I, I just think that from a supporter perspective, I think, and a Hurland fan, I'd love to see Antrim grow further. And, and I, that's why I want to reiterate, they need support, you know, more support. And I suppose, as I said, the leash game, they're looking to go down there with an air, air of confidence now on the back of performances they've put in over the last number of weeks. And they're looking to come away from Port Leash with two points. That, that's reality, to be honest. So, um, that, and that's what I'm expecting. Yeah, we're riffing a bit between the two games, but Paul, I'm going to ask you, because you saw Kilkenny against Leash, where are Leash at going into this game? Because it now becomes a hugely important match for them. It seemed they were improved based on how they played against Waterford in their defeat against Kilkenny at the weekend. Yeah, um, like I suppose Leash, Leash have t- taken a step back, I suppose, really overall from what we've seen over the last few years with them. Um, look, again, coming into this game, 
like it, they, they started really well into the match. You know, they, I think it went about four four points to one up, but then Tom Phelan came in and got a score, and that kind of killed Leash nearly straight away. Then, like they started well, they had a win as well, it's a very significant win in the first half, which I suppose they were eager to use. And early on, you got the impression in the first fifteen minutes once they went four points to one up, but then Tom Phelan got the goal. You nearly felt it was just gone after that because it was almost as if they went, we have to win here now, we're not using it, we're not using it. And it slowly started to chip away with them. Kilkenny, to be honest, once Mossy Keown got the point and they went ahead, um, you felt the game was over, to be honest. Kilkenny were actually, it was a very dominant performance by Kilkenny, in fairness. The inside forward line got 12 points by the first half, which that's that's a savage return. And I suppose it just shows you the alarm bells that were ringing in the leash full back line at that stage. If the full forward line are getting 12 points in the first half, there's something there's something not happening right here. Um, between the, I think it's 45th, 40. Uh, 5th to 50th minute Kilkenny really kicked on then uh, they scored 1-4 one, 1-5 one, on the trot and it just completely blew Leash out of the water really the subs were making an impact as well so Kilkenny had a, a really a really wide spread on scores as well but look Leash just seemed to be the confidence maybe isn't there at the moment you know again um, look they, they just seem to be not really moving well at the moment so that it is a big match to come into they don't have many huge positives to take I suppose really even since maybe the Tipperary match they have huge positives to be taken um, but it certainly didn't do them any favours to, to take the beat in Nolan Park because Kilkenny were just really uncontrolled Kilkenny finished with actually with 14 men because Conor Heary got injured and, and, and came off um, look it didn't really make a difference at the end it was only for the last few minutes but you know Kilkenny completely saw out the match and were, were, were really in control so look it wasn't a good preparation for Leash um, over the weekend but Look, again, I suppose it's down to Cheddar now to really lift them. You just have to be getting these matches, making them count now. You put yourself in an awkward position, but there's only one thing you can do now. Which that's just you have to react, whether that's a motivation and speech to get them to react or what, I don't know. But there's a few things that Leash really need to get right before we start seeing them gain any sort of traction. Yeah, and I would think the way Cheddar would look at this, Paul, is last year they didn't play particularly well in the league. They were going into championship in poor form. Then they played very well against Waterford in a qualifier, where Waterford going on to reach an All-Ireland semi-final on the back of it. And then they were able to beat Westmead and keep their Division 1 status at the end of that year as well. He'll be hopeful this is a work in progress and that they're going to improve as the league goes on. They, he'll probably just draw some inspiration from their late performances last year. Well, that's it, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's, it's what all he really can do, but I suppose it's not an ideal position, really. Um, you know, even if you're going into these games, they stay stuck with the Kenny um, till the end over the weekend and maybe kept it within six points and okay you'd be able to pick away at the bones of that and kind of say well where do we go wrong or where can we improve on but when you're taking the bigger beatings as well it's it can be very tough now to be honest I think the, the night they played Tipperary up in, in, in Port Leash it was a very bad night and it probably saved them maybe exposing a few of their, their weaknesses at the moment but um, look Cheddar have, probably had to go back to last year and say look at lads we you know we, we have better performances than this in us. They were relying really on scraps from freeze and different things as well. So when you're looking at that, you're kind of saying, look, that's, we're not producing. Somewhere along the way, we're not producing. It's not a case that we're producing these and we're striking lots of ways around and we're just not firing at the moment. So if he does have to go back to last year, look, that's not so long ago. But like we said, you know, and we applied it to, to, to Galway and Limerick at the start, there is a short turnaround now. You were getting closer towards the end of the league. There's a short turnaround to championship. So, you want to be taking the most from the last two games you have and, you know, wherever you have to get that bit of motivation or that bit of steel in the mind, you have to get it now because you don't want to carry those doubts over at the championship and then be kind of saying, you know, you're really putting yourself in a bad position. There's still time for leash, but they do, they need a big effort now at the moment to get themselves back on track. James, this weekend, one of the most important games then involves Kilkenny against a Dublin team who are just coming off the back of their win at Semple Stadium. This one could be tasty enough. Now, Kilkenny, I was reading Brian Cody's quotes after the game against Leash. He was saying Valley Hill players are going to be filtered back in, maybe not necessarily start this week against Dublin, but some of them will be available to play. We'll probably get a real sense of where Kilkenny are at after a game against a Dublin team who've been just so impressive in their first uh, five games or so this year. Yeah, I, I believe the game is on Parnell Park, am I right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so like Parnell Park, i tell you one thing, of, of all the grounds nationally, Carlin Park is one of the toughest ones, if not the toughest, to go and try and get a performance, especially playing against Dublin. Um, and like Kilkenny have a history there of having tough games against Dublin, not necessarily coming away to win every time. Um, Kilkenny have been going about the business quietly, you know, too quietly, for my liking. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'd like to see a bit more of them, <laughs> but they've gone about it quietly, yeah. 
the Bally Hale boys are back. I'm not sure if TJ back. I believe he's on honeymoon at the moment. Is he back? Will he be integrated? I think in based on his, his Instagram, if, if I'm going to be a spy yeah, on I this doubt one, it. I, I, I doubt think he's it. still well into the honeymoon. <laughs> so I think even, there, yeah. even, even if he came back uh, at this stage, James, I think it's going to be a couple of weeks before he's playing anyway. Oh, he's well entitled. Like He's well entitled for, the, for all he's done, let's say. But I, so you're probably talking Cody and wouldn't come back into the team. Um, probably add a bit of a kick to Kenny again. And they're facing a team who are unbeaten, you know, and again, unbeaten at home as well. So it's going to be a tough, tough task to ask for Kenny to go and take on a team who are flying high. It's one thing trying to take on a team with, with the ability, thinking you can take them on, you know, man to man, but Dublin have serious momentum. And I think going back to Thurles um, over the weekend, where they, they probably put in a bad showing against Cork last year, they had ample opportunities to beat them. You know, they had so many opportunities when you think that, that uh, the way the game transpired and the gap that was between Cork and Dublin with all the wise Dublin had, it was good for Dublin to go back down to Simple Stadium, put in a good performance. Um, they, yes, they got rolled back twice by Tipperary. They opened up kind of, I won't say commanding leads, but good enough leads got rolled back. But they won the game. I think that's what it's all about. They saw it out. They're playing a good pattern of play. They seem to be very, very, you know, uh, I suppose, collectively thinking in, in, in the way they're tackling together, in the way they're perceiving the game. When they, they know when to tackle, they know when to run, they know when to create, you know, when to deliver a ball, when, when there's space opening up and when to take on for goals. I like what Dublin are doing. And I'm just going to, from, from a neutral perspective, I just want to see Leinster counterparts, what the two of them have together, get them wetted from a goal perspective and see what, what transpires, you know. Um, because, like, when you consider, the, you're talking about the, a repeat of the Leinster, the Leinster final last year. So it's going to be interesting to see where both teams stand and how much shadow boxing there's going to be with, with five or six weeks come to championship. Right, Paul, respond to the fact that he's just said Kilkenny are going about their business a bit too quietly at the moment. Yeah, I don't like it. We're happy enough. We're not even making the Sunday game anymore, so we're happy enough with that. <laughs> there's, no one, there's no one getting any intelligence on us. We'll have to get but, Jackie um, back on. Yeah, look, I suppose Kilkenny are just, you know, there's a few matches there, like like, like the Leach match over the weekend, and different things that, you know, okay, the Tipperary match was a big one in terms of blood and a few lads. And, and you know, I suppose a big thing Kilkenny go on to be doing that either is giving, team, or giving players a false idea of where they are like the Tipperary match is a fair reflection of where the Kenny are at the moment I think as a whole in terms of different blood and that's yeah look at the Ballahay lads will be back and that'll be great like, I'd imagine the way he'll use them is he might start let's say Owen Cody but Adrian Mullen might be on the bench and introduce Adrian Mullen for Owen Cody I don't see him starting but you wouldn't know Brian he could throw it into the mix um, again I suppose just to create that bit of uncertainty with the rest of the team but for the rest of the Kenny lads like I mean Dublin over the weekend look they performed really well um, I think they were they were aided by Tipperary in many ways in terms of Tipperary's use by the ball. They kind of played into Dublin's hands to a certain degree. Um, and I think, like, you know, the likes of Paddy Smith there, Paddy Smith played a role sitting on the D and, and, and Tipperary fed him the ball, which was ideal. Look, Dublin can only play what's in front of them. But in, in fairness to them, they responded really well and they used the ball really well. Ronan Hayes got 1 1, like the half hour line for Tip or for Dublin, should I say, over the weekend. You know, you had Donald Burke with nine points, Reem McBride with 1 2. Danny Sutcliffe didn't score but he'd actually probably say he was the strongest of the whole lot considering what he was doing around the pitch so for the likes of Kilkenny you know David Blanchfield and these lads like Kilkenny hadn't really a settled half back line yet at the moment from what I see the team that played started the weekend I think David Blanchfield was the only player who actually started in the half back line so far in the league so the likes of David Blanchfield was a young player he's going to have to go out now and go toe to toe with Danny Sutcliffe and you know maybe if it's Niall Brazel like let's say these Lads who aren't necessarily household names, they're going to have to go up toe to toe with Donald Burke or Ian McBride. It's lads who are really in form. And again, like James is saying, up in Parnell Park, um, it's a very tough place to go. So it's a great gauge. I know it's one, certainly, I, I know the way the Kenny lads will be preparing that to see it as a great opportunity, which is that's what you want your players to see it as. If we're going out playing a physically aggressive team, a team that's in good form on their home ground. I mean, you don't shy away from these challenges. This is what you want. And Brian Cody will be definitely looking at this going, OK, I can take some things from the tip match and the matches we've been expected to win, we have won, great, that's all you can ask for. But here's a very good gauge now, um, our fourth match in, here's a good gauge of where we are. We'll treat it that way. He won't shy lads away. I mean, he's not going to go out there and start what he thinks is going to be a starting 15, I'd imagine, for championship. He'll still give lads a chance. But similar enough to like John Kyle was looking at it over the weekend, if you don't take your chance, you're coming off in this match. So this is a great chance now for any, any player, certainly, that if you're starting this game, Take your chance because Dublin are a good team and it's a good gauge to show what you can bring to the panel for the year. So it's a good opportunity. And again, like James is saying, in terms of seeing how Leinster might pan out, we haven't seen Wexford. Okay, we've seen Wexford and Galway, but now Kilkenny and Dublin. We'll have a good gauge really of where the main, I suppose, four teams in Leinster are going to be hitting come championship as well. So it's a big game, but look, Dublin are the informed team at the moment, you'd have to say, coming into the match.
yeah, we'll talk water from tip in a moment. But James, just take that point up about the way that Leinster is shaping up right now. Have you got any real feel of where the top four so sides are actually in Leinster as we get ready for a championship? As you mentioned at the outset, we're only less than two months away now. Yeah, like uh, the championship now, the Leinster championship is working back to type as well as with pre-COVID. So it's obviously it's home and away. You've got five games in a group of six. So basically it's not just knockout as it was before. Um, Galway, for example, have difficult games. They have to go to, you know, they have to go away to Wexford. They have Dublin coming in, Kilkenny coming in. So like that, that plays in, in itself. You know, if we were going to Kilkenny or, or Kilkenny were going to Wexford, you'd say, you know, it could be a different story. But in terms of ranking, if I was just taking the Leinster Championship at the moment, and just to be honest now, I'm not trying to be... <laughs> Then it was dismissive of anyone or, or any shadow boxing. Like Dublin are the farm team at the moment. They are. That's just the reality of it all. Like they're the farm team. They've shown the most. They performed the best in the Walsh Cup, honestly speaking. And um, they've been beaten in the league so far. Yes, things will graduate as the weeks go on, you know, when the league comes to a conclusion. But the way Dublin are, they've got five points or second point Walshford. If they can top Kenny this week, do they qualify for semi final? And who knows go from there? And I think from Matty's perspective, if he was to draw out his, his list of aspirations at the start of the year, I'd say he'd say win the World Cup. I think he'd say get to a semi-final in the league. I think he'd say win the Leicester Championship. And if he does those three, that's a very successful year for Dublin. You know, Anton beyond that, for me, is bonus territory. You know, I think they haven't won the Leinster since 13, I think. 2013, yeah. 2013, yeah. yeah. So I think if they win the Leinster this year, you're, you're kind of closing a nine-year gap. So that would be a great success for them. And they're going to be hard bet because, again, as we come back to it. Momentum is so key in hurling and so key in sport, you know. And I think from Dublin's perspective, right now, in year three of Matty's, Matty's, Matty's term, where they are preparing well, they seem to be executing a game plan that works for them and they're winning. That's the, that, they're, they're the three things. So if you prepare well, you, you try to execute a game plan, it comes off and you win. You know, that creates great confidence and momentum and you can keep going back to that in, in tough games. So I'm, I'm really in, interested to see this game. I think it'll, it'll tell a lot. Um, I know it's the league, but again, you're talking about 30 full, full-blooded males want to go at it and and see who comes out on top. So it'll still it'll set up a nice little uh, little championship battle for a few weeks' time. Yeah. Paul, moving on to Waterford against Tipperary. I heard this being called El Cahalico by some people on social media, which is a, a very clever name going into this one. Cahill made the decision to stay with Waterford as opposed to going back to Tipperary when the opportunity was there once Liam Sheedy went. And, you know, Bonner's been putting his own shape onto Tipperary in the first few rounds of the league. How do you see this game going between Tipperary and Waterford at the weekend? Two old rivals clashing in what's a very important game now in 1B because, as you know, James mentions, Waterford win, they go into the knockout stage. Similarly, Tipperary win, they're going to be almost on the verge of a semi-final spot mathematically as well. So there's a bit in the line this weekend in this one too. Yeah, yeah, look, there's a bit on the line and again, it's that old dynamic as well of the Liam Cal situation because, you know, in, in Tipperary, talking to a lot of Tipperary supporters, certainly around the time, you know, once, once word was got out there that Liam Sheedy was going, do you know, straight away they're looking at Liam Cal because the job he's after doing in water has been absolutely brilliant. And, do you know, believe it or not, I think the, the respect he's after gaining, I think countrywide from sticking with the, with what he's doing in water and saying, do you know what, I, I kind of want to see this out for whatever it's going to be. You know, I think across the, the, the hurling community, people have re- a great bit of admiration for Liam Cal. And, you know, I think as well, look, yeah, I mean, certainly Liam Cal mightn't admit this, but... The likes of these matches where he plays Tipperary, I think he sees this as sending a message to Tipperary, maybe not County Board or maybe whoever it's going to be, that like, you know, I'm a man that maybe certainly in the past should have been considered and I, I outlined the job I could have been doing and here is the job I'm doing at Watford. I expect, to be honest, Watford, given the way they're hurling, to win this match. And now I say expect, I don't say expect them to win it handy, but, you know, from what we saw of Tipperary over the weekend, again, there's still have areas to work in. They don't seem to know what way they want to play at the moment. They're not that they don't seem to, to know, but they haven't really, I suppose, put it into effect on the pitch, what they're maybe doing in training. I was looking at a lot of the ball that were given in um, in the Dublin match, and it was this ball of where, and again, it was actually fairly evident, the likes of Paddy Maher not being there. They were working the ball up to before the 65, and they were striking it into the full forward line, which to me was kind of saying that the emphasis was on maybe they had the top four match lads, but look, we have Shamey in there, we have Jake Morris in there, get the ball into them. But like, if you're, let's say in the Dublin match, if you're relying on a foot race, you know, with Owen O'Donnell or any of these lads, you know, that's a bad game plan to have. And we see any of the teams which Waterford do, for example, bring the ball up past that 65, or at least, you know, pop it to players in the half hour line with Tom McCork. That's where you're getting the results from. But Tipperary don't seem to be doing that yet. They don't seem to be this thing of clicking that we need to bring the ball further up the pitch to get the scores. Like Jake Morris, in fairness, was, was working really well over the weekend of what he was getting. He came away with three points from play, which was great. But, you know, he was an exception that he was working extremely hard. 
and he still only came away with three points where you see other players in different games getting a bigger return but not having to work as hard because the ball they're getting is very good. So Tipperary at the moment, I just think they have a good few places to work on, whereas Waterford aren't at that place at the moment. Waterford have put in some savage performances. They're, re- they're racking up big scores as well. They're getting a good wide range of scores. You know, you've Austin Leeson kind of taking over there again. Um, you have Stephen Bennett then as well as, you know, his normal going out and getting 12 points in a game, no problem. When you have lads all over the pitch kind of coming back into form as well. So um, it'll just, it'll be interesting to see. To be honest, I just think the intent that Waterford will come into this match with, because again, they'll be looking at last year semi-final against Limerick. They would have seen them as the number two to Limerick last year and we should have played them in an All-Ireland final. And I think Waterford will be saying, if we can get to an All-Ireland final and potentially meet, let's say, Limerick in it, you know, I that I, I think they have their bullseye on that at the moment, that if we can get there, we're probably the team that can knock Limerick off the top spot. So playing tip, I can guarantee Liam Cal will have these lads wound up that, first of all, we're going out there, we're winning, we're taking the points away from here, but we're also sending a message that, you know, this is what we're about, this is the way we're playing. I can guarantee he'll pick holes in the temporary game plan as well. He's, out, he's after seeing enough of them over the last while, that he'll pick holes, he'll, he'll target certain players, he'll know how to shut them down. And equally more important, he'll know how to convert it at the other end of the scoreboard. Well, James, the Kilkenny jury's verdict there is Waterford win. What way are you thinking? Um, I, I'm side with Kilkenny uh, on, on this instance, but I just think that um, you know Tipperary are a bit, are, they're a bit behind, you know. And I, I just think the, chip, the dynamic in Tipperary has changed somewhat. Uh, it just reminds me. This is a, a silly story, but remember when the helmets came in in compulsory about you know 2009, 2010. Mm. Uh, we played Cork in a league game or kind of a, a the league final and Sean Og had a helmet on, Don Og had a helmet on, The Rock had a helmet on. It just changed the dynamic. It just it took the kind of, they, they were kind of heroes in my eyes and, and they were so influential in terms of Cork's play at, at that time, you know, that when the helmet's on, they look like different people entirely. And I have the same feeling when you think of Tipperary. They're missing Brendan, they're missing Pawdy, you know, and when their boys are missing, it just changes the feeling of Tipperary and the whole narrative around them has kind of shifted from Top one, top two, maybe three down, and they've, they've dropped a bit in the pecking order, both publicly and probably in tip a bit, a bit as well. So I'm looking at this game and I'm thinking, what are they trying to establish? Because if you look at Shane McKenna at 14 the last day, he was a bit rusty. You know, I don't mind that. I don't mind in the league games that forwards are a bit rusty. What I'm looking for in league games is complete intent, 100% maximum effort, trying to establish a game plan and go from there. I'm not looking for individual brilliance or, or you to be in top form. That will come over the course of the next few weeks when, when you get into championship and and when the, the sod gets a bit drier. So individual people having those sort of performances is not worried. It's the way the team play as a whole. And Paul said, touched on it there a minute ago when he says about where the ball was being delivered. And that's a big that's a bigger worry for me if you're a Tipperary person is the passion, the way they're playing at the minute. It just, it just doesn't set us, set us up for success come championship. The way they're playing at the moment, collectively, in the, in the structure, they're not going to take down the big teams. They're not going to come out of Munster. That's just the reality at the moment. So, the, so that's, in, in terms of getting... People blooded in fair enough and getting getting some of their bigger players, I suppose, up in form. That doesn't outweigh the way the structure is going at the moment. So that's a bigger concern. I see them go down to Waterford and getting bet by five or six, to be honest. Right. You have a think, both of you, about your power rankings and not me doing my homework for Thursday for updating them. I'll remind the listeners about the results from the weekend just gone by. So in Division 1A, it was Limerick 113, Cork 2 goals at 19. Wexford winning on the road against Galway by 215 to 15 points. Clare won in Tullamore against Offaly 420 to 16 points. Now in 1B, it was Tipperary 21 points, Dublin 216 on Saturday night. So Dublin unbeaten so far in Division 1B. Uh, Kilkenny bouncing back from their defeat against Tipperary before the break by defeating Leash 228 to 17 points and Waterford getting out by a whisker against Antrim it was Waterford 321 Antrim 2 goals and 22 in Division 2A still find it very difficult to call this division Westmead bouncing back from their defeat against Carlo uh, to put in a very strong performance Niall Mitchell with 2 goals in the first half as they beat their neighbours Mead in trim by 423 to 1 goal and 15 again Conway inspiring Kerry as they beat Carlo away from home by 20 points to 13 Kerry lost their first game against Westmead but have now won 2 in a row and Kildare picked up their their first win on Sunday afternoon in Division 2A as well, overcoming down just about two goals and 17 to 22 points. So that is still wide open going into the last two rounds of fixtures there. On Saturday of this week, we've got Wexford against Offaly's the early game, 2 p.m. at Wexford Park. Cork against Galway's at Porky Cueve at 7. That's on the telly as well. And we've got Dublin against Kilkenny at Parnell Park. On Sunday then, it's Clare against Limerick. That's TG Carr's live offering at 1.45. We've got Waterford against Tipperary at Walsh Park at the same time. Alicia Nantrum's a little bit later, 
3.45 at MW Higher O'More Park. And that one already feels like a relegation playoff. The winners are likely to stay in Division 1B for next season. Right, that brings us around to our power rankings update, lads. Well, Skell got to go first last week and he dropped the bombshell. He was putting Wexford top and Wexford backed that up with their uh, result of the weekend. So, Paul, give us your top five then in the power rankings after the first three rounds we've seen. Yeah, so I, I suppose I, I went last week as I explained myself, not that I'm explaining away my uh, decisions here now, but um, I suppose basing it last year, off look, we've seen two matches up until last week and we're basing off, you know, okay, there was no panic for Limerick and so on, but um, I just think, you know, you look at the tables and the tables don't lie in terms of where teams are at at the moment, so I, I have big jumps here in it. Uh, some teams are sticking around, but Limerick are gone off the top spot and look, at, for me, I think if it would be fair by the league, I'm letting the league weigh in a bit more this week now um, I'm, I'm dropping them right down just because three losses there's other teams doing a lot of good stuff at the moment and there's plenty of time for Limerick to come back up but my top five at the moment I'm giving Cork their juice I was critical of them last week but look they went out they have three wins they're beating what's in front of them really good performance against Limerick and it was probably you know if sitting here this time last week if you told us this was going to happen we would say that, well, that's the maybe that will happen but they really performed really well so I'm going to Cork the top followed by Wexford in fairness, that's a reflection in the table, maybe only by scoring difference, but it's a reflection in the table. Wexford, again, look, okay, the Galway match maybe wasn't as intense as we wanted or expected, but they still went out and racked up a six-point win. I don't think it was a six-point match, to be honest. I don't think the match, you know, Galway deserved to lose by six months, six points. Not that it makes much of a difference, but in fairness, Wexford are beating what's in front of them. They're going about their business really well, with still a few players to go back. So if Cork won, Wexford two, still no sign of Limerick. I'm not going to be hard on Watford, mm-hmm. Watford three for me. Um, just again, they're still going about their business. They went up to Corrigan Park, which is a tough place to go. They have the Valley Gunner lads coming back. I mean, it's just, I think I think they're in a really good place. They know what they're about, and they have a lot of things going well for them. Then I'm going to put Limerick in there. I, I just think, look, three losses, two lads sent off. You know, again, there's, there's a few questions at the moment with Limerick. I have no doubt they'll prove me wrong over the next few weeks, and they'll start rising back up that board. But I, I think you can only for so long write out your thing is that you're the All Ireland champions. Um, you have to you have to convert that in the league as well. So Limerick are fourth for me, and then I have Galway in fifth. Again, look, I suppose they failed to really get going to what we've seen so far in the league um, over the weekend. But look, nevertheless, they were they were touch and go with Wexford. If they if they got a goal at the same time Wexford has got the goal in the second half, I think Galway would have come out of it. I think that was just how close the match was. So. For me, that's the top five for me at the moment. I've Cork, Wexford, Waterford, Limerick, Galway. Right, James. There's no way you can knock Wexford off the top now, can you? Because they were number one last week and they've just backed that up with a win. May I just say, right, that Mr. Murphy has changed his tune this week, hasn't he? <laughs> 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 the, the rankings no. are volatile, it seems. They are yeah. volatile. I said they changed, right? But I, I know because I'm, as you, because as you've, you've preempted, I'm not moving Wexford off. The There's no reason to. Um, they performed fierce well in Pierce Stadium, which were probably three of their best, without probably three of their best players in Liam Ryan, Conor McDonald, and Lee Chin. Lee Chin. So I think they're full value for where they are. Um, they've got probably, I suppose, an easier assignment, you could say. <laughs> Again, all due respect, softly coming no, up this weekend. Right. So I think they're going to be, uh, I suppose, pretty much set number one for the, for the next seven days at least. Number two, I have Cork. Um, it's no mean feat going up to, to Limerick and take care of business up there. They're a full value for the performance. They've, they've, I said last year they were probably in year one of trying to implement a Limerick type game plan. This year they're in year two. They've obviously got better at it. They've, they've the skill skill levels increased, intensity has increased, fitness and strength have all increased. So I think they're full value for number two and possibly could go to number one as it comes in the league. I think number three respect has to go to Dublin. The reason I have them kind of ahead of the water, I just think they've had a bit of a, a harder run, you could say. Um, you know, with the tip game coming coming, uh, I suppose before Watford have had a chance to play a top tier team minus Dublin. So I put them in at number three. They've gone down to Turles, taking care of Tipperary, regardless of where Tipperary are now in current standings. Going down there with, with, a, with, a, with a tough home crowd, to be honest, um, is, is, is not an easy thing to do. And they're full value for number three as well. Number four, I have Waterford. Again, going about the business quietly. Rally going on as we come back in, add a bit of a spice and thing again. And again, it's all about energy and their building blocks. And, you know, I think this week will tell a lot, again, in terms of where they're going to go. They should be for... If you're looking at Liam Cahill's trajectory where they are trying to get to a form basis, I think they should be taking care of Chip quite handily this week. Um, and I think, again, I expect that. Number four, number five, I, it's, I suppose it's, it's heart overhead, I put in Galway. Um, I can't put them down too much for, or else my phone will start hopping in the next, next while. <laughs> so I've left them in at number five. Again, look, I have to wait on the Limerick victory. I know, and again, as Paul said, 
there was a six point division between the two teams yesterday. Well, it wasn't six points. It was never that. It was probably a point or two in the grand scheme of things. I just think it was a case of missed opportunities at vital times. And where Wexford seizing those opportunities up the far end and it resulted in a six point turnaround. So again, I put them at five. Tough game to come with the weekend. Really, really tough. Um, went down to Park Creeve last year, performed fierce well, took on Cork, beat them again. And was They closed out the league last year, fierce well against, against Cork, but again, didn't perform against Dublin. So there's that element of inconsistency. I'm hoping to see that they bounce back but I'll probably a str- I'd like to see a stronger team. I'd like to see 11, 12 starters come in now and try to put up to Cork and beat them on their home patch. Again, yes, the victory is important, but Paul mentioned earlier, statement victory is even more important. You know, So I'm, I'm hoping they go down there and take care of business down there. Number six, I have Kikini. Um, again, going about business quietly, like they're, they're in third place in the table. They win this weekend, like away at Dublin, and they're right in the mix again for a league semi-final. So enough said about them lads okay moving on <laughs> I have number seven uh, Tipperary again Tip Limerick Clare Antrim the reason I have Limerick above Clare is because I expect them to go to Innes this weekend and take care of business which would then put them on even points but obviously the head to head is better so I think it's there's, will this, this will obviously move as the weeks go on you know as we get closer to the championship and things begin to heat up and full teams start going out as opposed to you know half teams this could change but again I reiterate uh, Wexford number one and full value for it. I already anticipated a tweet at some point from at Shannon Cider fan 1994 or something like that coming to us during the week saying I can't believe Scale at Limerick outside the top seven and uh, where did you put them again Paul do you went four? I threw them into four yeah it's, it's quite reasonable I, I'm not as dramatic now as, as James dramatic <laughs> you sound like my wife now I'm very, I'm very gradual with these things I like to ease through them and so uh, yeah I went in four yeah. I don't, by the way, discourage any kind of interaction to us at any point. Uh, at Off the Ball is where you're going to find uh, clips during the week from this very chat. I'm sure people will leave comments and disagree with our hot takes across the weekend and going into this weekend as well. Uh, you can also just go to our YouTube, which will be uh, premiering on Tuesday lunchtime when you can watch the video version of this conversation. Just leave a comment uh, down below, as many have this week. Many of the people that commented last week actually agreed with Scale, saying that Wexford are going really well. And now they've gone and backed it up. I'm sure they're going to double down on their enthusiasm enthusiasm next week as well lads it's been a pleasure as always chatting to you here on the hurling pod and looking forward to doing it all again next monday Cheers, well. thanks very much lads